Um, are you going to be standing here then just for the camera to make sure? sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. Anywhere sure. basically from here to the wall. Thank you. Okay. Is this on? Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it is great to be able to introduce Chong Yang, um, who is giving our seminar for today after a really long flight up from the chemistry building. Um, so she got her uh, BS in physics at the University of Science and Technology of China in 2003, uh, went to MIT for a doctoral degree on, in the Van Uden lab, uh, which she received in 2009, uh, and then did a postdoc at Stanford uh, in uh, James Farrell's lab. And so um, Chong has been here as a faculty member since January of 2014. Uh, her lab has some really great papers out. She has also a ton of awards that I wish I had, including a career award from the NSF, uh, Alfred Sloan uh, Fellowship, uh, Burroughs Welcome Fund grant. So really um, some great work going on here. I know her lab has been doing uh, some really interesting work, both using computational and experimental approaches to look at oscillators in the context of development. I think that is what we're going to hear about today. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this kind of introduction. Um, so, uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, so I, I'm very glad here to share some of the work uh, that will be working in my lab. Um, I wanted to start uh, with this video of a giant cell. This is a, a egg of the xenopus. Um, and after fertilization, you will see that uh, this cell is uh, basically chopped into smaller and smaller pieces in a highly precise and um, synchronous uh, and clock-like manner about every 25 minutes. Uh, so indeed, uh, this precise cleavage process is, is controlled by a clock. It's called a mitotic oscillator. And over the past decades, uh, the major players of this mitotic oscillator has been uh, discovered and uh, we understand the basics of this. So I'll just uh, quickly go through uh, like, uh, the current understanding of this clock. Uh, so in the interface um, where the uh, cyclin B mRNA is departed from the mother and it will be translated into the cyclin D protein. And this protein will bind to cyclin dependent kinase to activate it. And once CDK1 is activated, it will activate its own repressor. It's an anaphase promoting complex for the APCC. And this is an E3 ubiquitin ligase that will target cyclin B for degradation. So therefore, for the cyclin B line here, you will see cyclin B is uh, uh, like translated during the interface and degraded at the mitotic phase. Um, what's interesting about uh, is a blue line here, which is a CDK1 dynamics. So what you see here is uh, even though cyclin B binds to CDK1 its ability, uh, has the ability to activate it, CDK1 is not turned on right away. 
instead there is this long time delay. And this is because at the interface, there is a high level of the V1 uh, kinase, which is an inhibitor. So what V1 does is basically phosphorylate some uh, two phosphorylation sites of the CDK1 to keep it at the off state. Uh, and TL-cyclin B reaches a very high threshold. That's when the CDK1 turns on. Now, when CDK1 turns on, it's also a repressor of the V1 itself. So that forms a double negative feedback loop. Uh, there's another uh, protein here called CDC25. This is a, kind, uh, this is a, a phosphatase. And uh, this one uh, basically removes the same phosphor group that uh, we want uh, phosphorylated CDK1. So that's, therefore, it's the activator of the CDK1. Uh, and again, active CDK1 can activate CDC25. So therefore, it forms a double positive feedback loop. So together, of this double negative and double positive feedback loop can make the CDK1 switch from off state to on state in a very sharp manner. And uh, later, I, uh, we know that it's, uh, it's basically formed a bistable switch. Uh, so that is understood to make the uh, mitotic entry irre irreversible. So therefore, this double negative and double positive feedback loop, even though they are not required for oscillation, they're still very important to perform certain function for this cell cycle. Um, so cell cycle is just uh, one of the uh, many, many oscillators that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, that we know of uh, that controls uh, many essential cellular, physiological, and uh, developmental processes. So the ones that, uh, starting from the sub-second neuron spikes uh, to uh, like a heartbeat, about one second, and then cell cycles itself span a, a very wide range of the uh, period. And then we have this de developmental clock called the segmentation clock, uh, which I will talk a little bit later. And then we have this circadian clock to control the sleep wave cycles and, uh, and many others. So you will see that these clocks behave very differently. Uh, so they, uh, their time scales span orders of magnitude. So they, they look very different. Um, but as a physicist by training, uh, one of the essential questions in the lab is, uh, we wonder if we have uh, like uh, some common design principles that may be shared among all these similarly different clocks to control certain functions. The, the, uh, a few reasons, uh, which I will point out. Uh, so first of all, uh, if you interrupt any of these clocks, uh, you will get all kinds of diseases. So it's very important to study the function. Uh, so what maintains the function? Right? So the reason that uh, I think there, it's possible to identify some common design principles uh, is that uh, for all these clocks, even though they uh, appear to be different, um, they seem to share some common functions. So the first uh, uh, notable function is the tunability. Uh, so many clocks, like a heartbeat or cell cycle, uh, they respond to environmental cue. So they, their uh, frequency can be tuned largely based on the, uh, like say, temperature in the environment or light or nutrition. Uh, however, their amplitude uh, stay in a more or less stable physiological range. So that's a tunability, tunability in frequency. So that's one property that seems to be important to many clocks. Um, so another important thing is the robustness. And that's actually very important for many, many uh, biological systems, not just a clock. But for clock, it's especially important because for any timing machine, we want it to be very accurately to guide uh, the, whatever the processes that uh, we are interested in. Uh, so to understand the design principle underlying these two functions, uh, it can be challenging if we are looking into all these molecular details. So if you just uh, take a, uh, like a cell cycle as an example, uh, if you take uh, the data from the CAC database, uh, you find that it's easily uh, having like hundreds of molecules uh, that regulate this uh, cell cycle processes. So it's very hard to identify or gain the insight what are the important uh, like key fundamental um, you know, principles. Um, so instead, my lab used a different approach. It's called a synthetic biology approach. Uh, so here, uh, the goal is to uh, ask, uh, can we design a minimum oscillator that can uh, perform the same function that the complicated networks do? And maybe we can learn from these minimum designs about the more complicated systems. Uh, so this idea is not very, uh, 
is all very new in terms of the theory, uh, because in theory, uh, uh, we can design a uh, like a, uh, this single negative feedback oscillator dated back to this Goodwin oscillator. This is a classical Goodwin oscillator. So in this uh, in this network, uh, basically you can have a very simple three uh, node system. So you have a gene A that can transcribe to uh, mRNA D and then translate it to protein C. If C repress A itself, that forms a single negative feedback. Um, but because of the transcription and translation, you also have these essential time delays so that your single negative feedback is not uh, damped into a stable steady state. So this idea uh, was pretty old, but um, the, the, the real uh, engineered oscillator in experiments uh, is more recent. Uh, so the, the first, uh, arguably the, the first uh, engineered uh, like oscillator uh, can be uh, this work uh, by Michael Alouz and Stan Libler. So they form uh, this, uh, this single negative feedback by three genes that repress one another uh, to form what they call the repress later. And if they put this repress later into the E. coli cells, about 40% of the E. coli cells can perform self-sustained oscillations. So that's not bad. And uh, three years after Alexander Ninfa's group, uh, actually on, on our campus here, uh, so they designed additional positive feedback that coupled with this negative feedback. Um, so what's interesting about the last design is, it looks like um, uh, if we do a survey of all the natural oscillators, even though their molecular uh, like the regulators are quite different, they all seem to share this uh, coupled positive and negative feedback group. Uh, so one question here is, uh, if we know the negative feedback loop is essential for the self-sustained oscillations, then what's the role of the positive feedback? Why evolutionary, you will see this again and again in all kinds of the different systems. So this question was uh, earlier asked by a computational paper. Uh, it's uh, done in Jim Farrell's lab. Uh, so here, what they study is to compare three different topologies. They all share the same core, which is a repress later. Um, and then in one of them, they add a self-positive feedback. Uh, in another, they add a self-negative feedback. And then they score for their performance by a random parameter scan. Uh, so if they found that uh, for, for one topology that has more parameter sets to support this topology for oscillations, uh, they will say this topology is more robust. So that's a, um, a quantification for robustness. So what they found here is only the middle one where you have the self-positive feedback has a, a more robust behavior, but not the negative or the core itself. So their conclusion here is the positive feedback can improve the robustness of the oscillator. Um, but more recently, there is an experimental study so here, they, uh, they basically use uh, uh, engineer the bacteria that can interact in, with each other through chrome sensing. And the green here is the activator bacteria, so it can activate itself and also activate uh, the neighboring like uh, other species, the yellow bacteria. And uh, on the other hand, the yellow bacteria is the repressor bacteria, so it can uh, also repress the green bacteria uh, again through chrome sensing. So now, if they engineer additional negative feedback uh, to this circuit, they found it's more robust. So then, uh, their conclusion is a negative feedback increase the robustness. So you will see that here that uh, there seems to be a different view of which works better for increasing robustness, right? So what do we think uh, is uh, maybe the problem is that uh, in each of these studies, uh, they only focus on one specific core. However, uh, if we um, like appreciate right in nature, uh, we we can have all kinds of different designs to achieve the same function, uh, even though some might work better than the other. Um, but uh, if we want to identify the most fundamental principles, we have to look at them all instead of just a subset of the topologies. So that actually is a, a motivation for this computational uh, work uh, is led by a very talented graduate student, Zhen Dali. So he has already graduated in May. He's now uh, a postdoc in Jim Farrell's lab. Uh, so in this work, uh, we basically look at a 
uh, a topology space uh, for three node networks. Uh, so all possible wirings instead of just the one or two. And uh, you will see that there are uh, 3,325 possible topologies we can look at. And then for each topology, we do a random parameter scan, just like what uh, uh, in Jim's lab do. And then uh, to map that in a parameter space. Um, and then we have a score here, uh, also score for the robustness of certain topology. So in this case, uh, it's basically uh, the volume of this um, parameter space that can support this topology for oscillation. And if the volume is larger for one topology than the other topology, we say it's more robust than the other topology. Okay. So with this system, we can identify a total of uh, 1,420 clock topologies, meaning that they can, uh, at some specific parameter sets, they can oscillate. So we define them as a, topo as a uh, clock topology. So uh, we arrange them such that uh, these topologies, the complexity is ranging from low to high, uh, like uh, uh, scored by the number of the edges they have. Um, and within each row, uh, they have the same complexity. And we also uh, arrange them, sorted them based on the Q value, which is a hit rate in the parameter space. So in another word, it's a robustness quantification. So uh, the leftmost, uh, the the orange one is most robust topologies, and the rightmost, uh, which is the blue one, is the least robust topologies. Okay. So now each single dot here is one topology, and they can connect uh, one another by adding or removing a node or edge to becoming another topology. So uh, the fact that you can see all of them are connecting with each other, uh, that may be. Uh, May means that uh, so evolutionary we can always find uh, uh, some kind of evolutionary path to evolve from the simplest design to the most complicated design without losing us. Um, so this this is basically the uh, the whole atlas of the clock topologies. So what we can learn from there? Uh, so first of all, we are interested in the most uh, the minimum design, right? So which is the bottom eight of them. So the minimum means that if you remove any node or edge, it's just a stopability for oscillation. So uh, we also call it that the cores because these uh, eight topologies are the roots of uh, all the other topologies. Okay. So what are they? Uh, so we sorted them again based on the Q value, the robustness. And we found that the top three most robust ones are the ones that we are familiar with, we introduced before which is the repress later, the positive couple with negative feedback loop, and the good wing oscillator. And these three seems to be orders of magnitude higher uh, in robustness than the rest of the five. So then we say these three are the robust cores, and then these five are non-robust cores. And so the question is, uh, can we explain all the complicated topology robustness based on just the core compositions they have? So to find it out, we group all these topologies in the atlas based on the core composition. So the empty here means that none of the topologies within this group has any of the three core robust cores. But they can have any of any combination of the five non-robust cores. Okay. And so uh, on average, we seem that uh, the more robust cores they have, the more robust they are because this is a uh, percentile, uh, rank percentile of the Q value. Uh, so the smaller of the value, the more robust they are. Uh, so, so it means that on average, I mean, that's not surprising. Um, however, if we look closer to the topology within one group, uh, we will have a puzzle here. So uh, for example, here within this group, uh, so all of them share the same core, um, but their behavior varies uh, in a large range. So what caused that variability? So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, another thing that we didn't understand at the time was uh, if we look closer to the core topologies, uh, we found that uh, intuitively we would not be able to tell whether the core two will be more robust than core six because both core two and core six has a slow negative feedback loop coupled with a fast positive feedback loop. So, however, um, 
their behavior, their, their Q value differ by a factor of 45. So what caused that? And what's more interesting is if we do a survey in the nature, we found that uh, almost the all oscillators we know about has a core two design, but never has a core six. Okay, so that's another question. But then we think maybe um, when we look at these topologies, we miss some fact that local interaction also matters. So to find out the local interaction, um, uh, like how, what kind of local interaction, uh, we call a motif, uh, really plays an important role, we do a pairwise comparison for any two neighbors uh, of the atlas that I just showed you. Uh, so by neighbor means that, again, it's, it's connecting with each other. So by removing or adding an edge or a node, they can convert into each other. So then we decompose each, uh, each topology into two edge motifs. So this two edge motif will indicate the interaction at, a, at that node. And then uh, we will take into account the difference of the two edge motif of these two neighbors, and then the difference of their output, which is the robustness, the rank percentile of the robustness. And then we use some statistical tools. Uh, so the lasso is linear regression technique, uh, and compared with the partial rank correlation coefficient, it seems that both of them identify the same patterns. Uh, so namely that uh, we found that these three uh, motifs help the oscillator more robust. And what are these three? So these three has a, a node that receiving two inputs of different signs. So it's the opposite regulation. Um, and then the top four here is decreasing robustness, uh, which are um, all have a node that receiving the two inputs have the same sign. So then we call the top as a coherent input motif, and then the bottom as an incoherent input motif. So whether they can play the uh, function of the whole topology, uh, we now do the group again. Uh, so now instead of one dimension, we do two dimensions. So basically we group uh, the topologies just by counting. So we count how many numbers of the nodes that they have the incoherent input versus coherent input. And then we found that the more uh, nodes they have incoherent input, the less they have the coherent input, the more robust they are. And this effect seems to be additive. So again, um, if we want to design some robust oscillators, this may be useful, right? Because we can just uh, count how many, we, we can avoid the coherent and uh, add more incoherent input into the network. Um, so this seems also uh, unify the previous findings um, because for uh, Jim's work, right? So here, uh, the positive feedback uh, must be added to increase robustness because it generates uh, incoherent input here. And then here, you would need to have a negative feedback in order to generate uh, incoherent input. And it seems that this incoherent input motif are also enriched in the natural oscillators and synthetic oscillators we know about. So basically to conclude here is, uh, we have done a computational study to show that topology can play an important role to change uh, the behavior of the oscillators. And we found that uh, it seems the uh, incoherent input interaction can help the oscillation robustness. This may explain why uh, in nature we have very complicated designs that, uh, and many peripheral structures are not required for oscillation but still evolutionary conserved. So maybe they are evolution conserved for some certain functions that these clocks needs to have. Um, but these are all the computational studies. To really find that out, uh, we have to rely on the experimental designs. So in our lab, uh, we are focusing on cell cycles. Um, okay. Because, uh, well, cell cycles, first of all, it has all these uh, interesting uh, topology wiring that um, can, use, can be used to test our computational studies. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging to study cell cycles in live uh, cells or live embryos. Uh, so out of all these uh, challenging reasons, like uh, low throughput, hard to manipulate, the most uh, tricky one is this. So for any cell cycle uh, in the live cells, uh, for, for any cycle to complete, you always end up with a cell division. And that cell division will introduce some kind of partition errors and some other complicated stuff that we may not understand fully. 
So it seems out that we need to design a simpler system. So here, here's our strategy. Uh, so what do we do here is we basically take all these uh, eggs, group them together, and then break them down. And then we take the cytosolic part, inject into the microfluidic chamber filled with oil. So that allows us to generate this uh, water in oil emulsion at, at a specific size that we want. And that, uh, we call it artificial cells. And I will show you that why uh, we, we call it this way. Uh, so basically, once we have this droplet, uh, we consider it as a cell. We load it in the chamber and then incubate for many, many hours and then track using fluorescence uh, microscopy and then imaging processing. Okay, so with this system, we can first uh, reconstitute the mitotic cycle inside this simple system. And I hope you can see here. Uh, so uh, what we show here is a single droplet. It's a very simple system. You don't even see DNA inside. So, um, and on the right here is a bright field, and on the left here is a fluorescence channel uh, where we use a fluorescence reporter called Securing M. Cherry. So securing is anaphase uh, substrate, which can be translated during the interface and degraded at the mitotic phase. So therefore, you will see this oscillation behavior. And to show that it's not artifact from any you know, fluorescence reporters, uh, we also attach the same substrate with uh, EC, ECFT, a different fluorophore. And we show that the behavior is very similar. Okay. So that is basically the simplest possible a uh, cell we can build because it's, it's a cell cycle that, that can oscillate for many, many uh, times and, uh, and there is no DNA. However, uh, if we add DNA into the system, it can self-assemble nuclei. And, um, and this nuclear event seems to be downstream of this oscillator. So oscillator functions in this way, uh, which is to control uh, the nuclear envelope breakdown and the chromosome condensation in a periodic manner. Uh, so we use a GFT NLS, uh, which is a nuclear localization signal uh, uh, that, can, that can report the nuclear envelope breakdown events. Uh, because in the interface, when nuclear is intact, you will have all these uh, fluorescence protein located into the nuclei. But when the nuclear envelope breaks down, you will see that it's uniformly distributed into the cell. And uh, um, correlatively, you will see that chromosome condense uh, during the nuclear envelope breakdown. And at the same time, the securing is degrading as a metodic phase. So it's, it will be easier if, you, uh, if we can track one single droplet for uh, different channels. And we can see that uh, this droplet oscillate for two cycles uh, from interface mitotic phase, interface and mitotic phase. And I hope you can see this correlation events. And interestingly, the a uh, bright field image can also see this con contrast of the nuclear envelope here. Okay, so we have this, uh, um, this more complicated cell that behaves similarly as a real cell. Uh, so basically we have this system and we want to see uh, what we can do with it. Uh, so before that, uh, I want to show you the, the property of these oscillations. So uh, first of all, this single droplet seems to oscillate uh, very well. Uh, so it has, in this case, 30, uh, 32 cycles over four days. And we know that if people are working with a Xenopus system, we know that for any bulk system, it's hardly oscillated beyond a few cycles. So that means in the microenvironment, that somehow improves the uh, ability for oscillation. Um, so uh, that's good. But also we found this weird behavior uh, where we, we see that over time, uh, we have increased the baseline, increased the amplitude, and increased the period. And to show that it's not, again, it's not a fluorophore specific, we also uh, had uh, another fluorophore CFT, and it has a similar behavior. So basically, over time, uh, we have increased the, uh, in, increased the amplitude and increased the period, and we can quantify it here. Okay, so what's going on here? So in this system, uh, we basically take the cytosol out. So we throw away the yolk. And uh, we have probably some limited amount of mitochondria still there. Uh, but most of the nutrition stuff is gone. And um, so 
so consider a cell cycle is an out of equilibrium process and it consumes a lot of energy. And in our system, uh, we can consider it a limited energy source uh, to start with. Uh, so over time, we have to consider energy consumption in this case. So in our standard cell cycle model where we don't consider ATP, we assume ATP is a lot, like uh, uh, we don't, uh, don't have the limitation of the ATP. Then you will see that uh, this oscillation is basically stable limit cycle with a stable um, amplitude. Uh, however, if we consider ATP limitation here, so what, what happens is, uh, so for CDK1 activation and inactivation, it's controlled by this double positive and double negative feedback group, as I introduced from the beginning. Uh, so the V1 and the CDC25 are antagonized uh, events. Uh, so the, when you have a lot of the ATP, um, the, the V1 basically is a phosphorylated, uh, which is an inactive form. And the CDC25 will be also phosphorylated, which is an active form. And that means uh, you, you now have uh, an excessive amount of the activator of the CDK1 than the repressor. So therefore, the system is driving to the activation process. So that's just an intuitive explanation. But if we include that in our model, we will show that it can recapitulate the basic properties of the oscillation that we see experimentally. But whether this is true, I mean, this is just a, uh, some model hypothesis, right? Uh, so we need to design some experiment to test it. So here, uh, Shuya is leading this project and uh, collaborate with the uh, undergrad here, Daniel. Uh, so uh, what they do here is uh, they first uh, test the, the system by adding different amount of the ATP. So this is the energy uh, mix. So it's an energy regeneration system. Uh, so if you add, uh, like more and more ATP here, you find that within each group, you still see this uh, increasing period and amplitude. However, if you compare across the group, uh, you find that the more ATP you have, uh, the less period and the less amplitude you will have, which is as um, predicted in the model. And then you will be able to see clearly, more clearly if you just do a simple quantification to group all these. Um, like a single traces of oscillation. Okay, so that is uh, uh, one preliminary data. So, okay, uh, so one thing we also noticed that uh, is if we separately looking at the rising phase of the saccharine and the boiling phase of saccharine, we know that the rising phase is the interface because it's a translating of the saccharine and the falling phase is the metallic phase, it's degrading. And uh, we found that the ATP seems only affecting the rising phase, the interface, but the mitotic phase is keeping pretty stable. It doesn't care how much ATP you have. And that may mean that the interface, uh, well, the mitotic phase is very robust and it's, it's basically keeping a certain uh, uh, a time scale. And that seems to be also supported by another study using the mammalian cell lines. They found it's more noisy in the other uh, cell cycle phase, like G1S and G2 phase, but it's more uh, accurately controlled in the metallic phase. Uh, and we also uh, found it's, uh, it's the same behavior for the more complicated cells where you introduce the nuclei. And in this case, uh, we're using the GFE analysis again, uh, as a reporter. Uh, so for, from here, you will see the standard deviation of the intensity to show uh, the GFP localization uh, signal. And uh, you will quantify the period in this way. And you find that the interface is uh, variable and the metallic phase is pretty stable. And in fact, we can use our cell cycle model to explain it. And so our cell cycle model is a relaxation type of oscillator. And uh, it contains a positive feedback loop and that seems to be uh, important to uh, insulate the mitotic phase to keep it uh, precise. Okay. So um, that's basically what we can do in experimental system by adding different amount of the ATP to start with. But that only controls the bulk uh, ATP concentration. And then uh, we do not have uh, the specific knowledge about each individual oscillator behavior in terms of the ATP and the uh, oscillator behavior. Uh, so to find it out, uh, 
Shuya and Mon uh, collaborate and then uh, design this experiment. So what they do here is they have this pressure-based microfluidic control system. Uh, so basically, so in this case, you have uh, three inlets. Um, so the left here is just the extract with some other reporters. And the right here is the extract with the ATP. And you also have different dyes to tell uh, how much of these uh, molecules is encapsulated in each droplet. So in that sense, you basically based on the, the dye intensity to tell how much ATP you have in that specific droplet. So for example, here, uh, the red here, the red uh, droplet here has the most ATP, and then the yellow droplet here has the least ATP. And it can be controlled by pressure, so that means we can have a gradual uh, like a tuning of that parameter dimension. So uh, I hope you can start to see some kind of correlations uh, in terms of the dye intensity and the oscillation behavior. And I mean, this is by eye, it, it shows that, but then she analyzed it, it seems to, uh, to confirm it. So basically, the more ATP you have, the so x-axis here, uh, the, the faster of the oscillation, and also the smaller of the amplitude. Um, and it also confirmed the previous findings about the phase-dependent ATP, uh, like a uh, like phase-dependent behavior uh, controlled by ATP. So for example, uh, the interface, which is the top here, the rising period, uh, is very variable. Right? And, um, <coughs> and the mitotical phase, the falling phase here, is pretty much tightly controlled within a certain range. OK, so uh, that's, that's our um, preliminary results for the ATP-dependent um, like behavior. But one thing we are still missing here is uh, for our current experimental design, there are some drawbacks. Uh, first of all, uh, at the bottom here, we are using the anaphase reporter, which is, uh, uh, which is controlled by APC. That's a repressor of CDK1. So it's not a direct uh, indicator of the CDK1 activity. So to really find out the CDK1 activity, we have to use um, another sensor. So in this case, we adapt uh, a sensor designed by John Pines Group. Um, and uh, it's a flat CDK1 sensor, and that's our preliminary results. Um, and so basically, we are hoping to improve, optimize this sensor for our study to replace uh, the securing uh, reporter. And another thing is, uh, we know that over time, uh, the ATP is consumed. So even though we can control initially how much ATP we can distribute it in the droplet, right? We cannot control over time in real time. So then that means it's very important for us to have the ability to measure the ATP in real time. So then uh, we uh, also adapted the ATP uh, sensor, uh, it's called Queen, um, and then to, to basically measure the ATP in real time uh, in the same droplet with uh, another reporter to measure the mitotic oscillator. So that's a direct correlation. Um, so now I, I want to switch the gear uh, to basically uh, show you what other things we can do in the lab, right, using the same system here. So uh, as what I said, the tunability is very important on clock uh, functions. And I listed here for all these clocks that have the wide range, uh, wide ability, uh, I mean, the ability to tune uh, the oscillation in a wide range in frequency. Uh, so what caused that? That's, that's our question. Uh, so, um, well, the frequency tuning and amplitude, amplitude tuning both uh, have been found in signaling molecules, I mean signaling networks. And the, the basic understanding about these two is the frequency tuning can uh, make the coordinative uh, tuning of the downstream uh, genes, like I say, a, a strong gene A and a, a weak gene B coordinatively. Well, the, Amplitude tuning cannot. So that's, a, that's one understanding here. But in our cell cycle, um, we think that the, uh, the frequency tuning might be uh, related to the positive feedback here, based on a previous study, again, by James Lab. Uh, so in this study, uh, they look at this cell cycle model, and then they basically uh, computationally vary the positive feedback strength. So in this case, it's R here. So the higher strength of the positive feedback 
the wider of the tuning you can do in frequency. So that's a model prediction. So now, no experimental study yet. Um, and also that's just the one specific cell cycle model. And we wonder if this positive feedback on being important for tunability can be generalizable to other type of oscillators. So in this study, Jenda uh, used the same framework that he used for robustness. And in this case, in addition to random parameter scan, he also start from this random center and then do a tuning for both sides and then until it finds a boundary. So, and then it can basically map out uh, what the frequency behavior is changing across this tuning range. And that's two examples here. So one is a Goodwin oscillator coupled with a positive feedback. The other is a Goodwin oscillator coupled with a negative feedback. And uh, what he found is for uh, the second case here, where you have the negative uh, oscillator, uh, I mean, negative feedback coupled, you find that most of this tuning is only in amplitude, and it's very hardly tuned in frequency. And only if you have this case, where you have the positive feedback, you start to have this frequency tuning mode. So it seems to support the previous finding for cell cycle. And so we want to uh, see if we can design experiments to test this idea. So the most intuitive uh, uh, tuning for cell cycle might be temperature, right? So for many of you, if you are doing studies of different cells, you find that if you change temperature at different range, uh, like uh, uh, you can change the oscillation speed. So uh, here, Mon, uh, a person in, in my lab, uh, he has designed a temperature gradient chamber. So basically the idea is to be able to tune the droplets across this temperature gradient and to see uh, the behavior of that. So that's one way. Um, but that is more global tuning because if you vary temperature, you, you vary a lot of parameters. And uh, so here we wonder if we can do a more direct tuning. So in this case, uh, we know that the cell cycle input is cycling B. So if you add more cycling B and MRA, uh, you can tune the oscillator in a faster manner. Uh, so cycling B is also, an, it, it has a dual function. So it has N terminals and C terminals. So the N terminals uh, basically share the same sequence as the, I mean, the uh, recognition of the securing. So both of them are uh, recognized by APC. Uh, so it can be used as a reporter uh, for degradation uh, in the anode phase. But on the other hand, uh, the C terminals of cycling B can bind CDK1 for activation. So if we add different amount of the uh, cycling B, uh, like manually, right? This is a preliminary data. We can see that we can tune the oscillator speed from uh, the period from about somewhere above 150 minutes to somewhere below 100 minutes. So that's a, uh, some reasonable dynamic range. Um, but that's very low throughput because we, we have to add, uh, like add the second B manually. So, uh, we wonder if we can use this uh, pressure-driven uh, microfluidic chamber again for this project. Uh, so basically, we have these three uh, inlet tuning again. And then for each uh, inlet, uh, we can basically add a different uh, drugs or recombinant molecules to tune at a different range, uh, across a different range in a, in a very continuous manner. Uh, so here's the... Uh, some preliminary results. It's a busy slide, but I just quickly uh, go through here. Uh, so first, uh, with this setup, we wonder, can we um, remove the endogenous cycling? Because in our extract system, there is cycling B already deposited from the mother. So we can add the morpholinos of the xenopus cycling B to remove them, right, to also tune the oscillator as a, to the slower range. Um, and if we want to get to the faster range, we basically add the human cycling B, uh, which is not recognized by Xenopus morpholino, that can uh, increase the, uh, the speed. So basically, we can tune the oscillator in both directions. So the top results here show that morpholino works, um, because if you add more morpholino here, the percentage of the droplet oscillation drops. Uh, and also, if you add more morpholino here as a y-axis, you will see that uh, the period increase which is as expected. Uh, so with that, we can add a 
a substantial amount of the morpholino to get rid of all the xenopensacrin B. And then on the other hand, we can add a human cyclin B and also add the V1 inhibitor because we can tune in both dimensions. Uh, so the V1 inhibitor here is to remove, to reduce the positive feedback strength. So basically in the model, uh, we predict that uh, the higher of the positive feedback strength, the higher tunability you can have. So in this case, it seems to show that case. Uh, so if you have a low V1 inhibitor, which is high positive feedback strength, you have a pretty wide range of the period that you can see. But this range, it seems to reduce as you add more and more uh, V1 inhibitors. Okay. So yeah, so uh, I think we have, um, yeah, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so I only have a few slides. I think I want to take the advantage uh, to share what we are doing now or, or, uh, or in the future using this uh, current system. So for example, one of the things we can answer uh, is um, based on the previous study, where in the, uh, in the early embryonic cycles, um, and actually for any cell cycles probably, uh, is that uh, there is this uh, spatial positive feedback. So meaning that uh, not only, so we know that um, the temporal positive feedback of the CDK1 is well studied, so we know that. Um, but the spatial positive feedback is, uh, if you have more active CDK1, it translocate easily, more easily into the nucleus. And that translocation can improve more um, CDK1 to be turned on. So that's a spatial positive feedback. So in theory, uh, we know that this spatial positive feedback can give the spatial hysteresis. And we wonder if uh, this property in, like basically by compartment of, the, um, of these molecules, right, to um, isolate at a specific uh, location can also help to improve the accuracy of the temporal property. So Gambu in, in our lab is using uh, optogenetics trying to answer this question. So another uh, thing we can study using the system uh, is uh, related to cell size. Uh, so our preliminary data shows that the size matters. Actually, if we tune the uh, oscillator, uh, sorry, if, you, if we tune the size uh, of the droplets, that seems to affect the oscillator behavior. And we also know that the size also is important uh, parameters in the early embryo uh, development. So that's another thing we can study. And finally, if we add a different amount of the DNA uh, into our droplet system, we can tune the DNA content, and we can also tune the nuclei to subtle solid ratio in the volume. And that uh, is important for the mid blastro transition, uh, which is the first uh, developmental stage of the embryos. So we hope to use our system to take, uh, uh, to, to study this, um, this system. Okay. So, um, and uh, yeah, so, so this is very quick. Uh, so uh, I think I talked a lot about uh, the single oscillator behavior. Um, but if we imagine that we can put many oscillators uh, in an excitable media, uh, that can allow uh, for the wave propagation to be generated. Like what you, like what you see here. I want to show the video here. So yeah, the so right one is not showing, but that's okay. Uh, th this one is just a target wave of the cell division of the Drosophila embryo from the left to the right. Um, so this is for the biological system. You see that it's viral wave and target wave and many other kinds of wave you can imagine. Um, but this is not unique to the biology system. Actually, way back, uh, you, you have this DZ wave in chemistry. Uh, so, so additionally, uh, we know that multiple different oscillators can co-regulate uh, co the same process. And uh, also, multiple oscillators can stay in one specific cell to control the uh, behavior of the cell. And indeed, uh, in the simple cyanobacteria, we found that uh, circadian clock can control the cell division cycles to tell at which time of the day the cell can divide. So we want to use, um, we want to focus on these directions. Um, so one direction we have is uh, this. 
so basically we know that trigger wave is understood as an efficient way for communicating over a long range. Um, and uh, the classical example is the action potential that propagating from one side of the neuron to the other side. Uh, and when the distance is long, uh, just by simple molecule diffusion is simply not going to work. So you have to have some kind of trigger wave mechanism. And uh, the mitotic trigger wave was first discovered in Jim Farrell's lab, uh, and they used this uh, cell-free system. And we adapted that system to our study. So in this system, we basically generate uh, two different uh, um, like a wave propagation behavior. One is just uh, have the uniformly distributed CDK1 oscillators. Uh, so in this case, we don't encapsulate in the droplet. We allow them to share in the same cytosolic um, area. And uh, in another, we can add the DNA to generate this single nuclei. So on the left here, we call it a simple biochemical wave. On the right here, we call it as a nuclear wave. And uh, to our surprise is for both one dimension and two dimension, it seems that the biochemical wave is much faster than the um, nuclear wave. So we wonder maybe that's because some of the heterogeneity uh, happening here. So we know that CDK1, when it's activated, it translocates into the nuclei. So that essentially uh, can be a barrier for the communication among the nearby uh, wave because it cannot freely diffuse it anymore. Um, and then uh, only after nuclear mode will break down, you can start to uh, communicate. So we think uh, maybe this wave behavior is fundamentally different than the biochemical wave behavior. So Ova and Minji are studying this uh, question. So the whole other uh, area of the lab is, is actually related to zebrafish live embryos. Uh, and, and also more recently in the dissected tissues and single cells. Uh, so we are interested in somatogenesis because this process, well, first of all, it's, uh, it's uh, well conserved for all the vertebrates. Uh, so it's a periodic formation of the somites, which is a precursor of the body segments for all vertebrates, uh, from zebrafish to our human. And uh, so there are two clocks control the same process. Uh, one is the segmentation clock which seems to coordinate with the somatic formation period. Uh, and segmentation clock can exist in each single uh, cell or in the uh, pre-somatic mesoderm region. Uh, another clock is the cell cycle, because if you have this uh, uh, elongation of the fish, you have to basically pre uh, proliferating uh, to, to generate more and more cells. Uh, so one of the questions that we are interested in is how these two clocks are coupled together to coordinate to make this very precise pattern formation. Um, so additionally, we know that the frequency of the oscillator seems to slow down from posterior to anterior. And the actual reason for that is not uh, known yet. Um, but one review paper here uh, basically shows that uh, the, the mechanical property of this uh, TSM region also varied from posterior to anterior. Basically, the cells at the posterior are more mobile, and uh, it also has more tissue rigidity, oh, sorry, less tissue rigidity, um, and uh, the cell density is also lower comparing to the anterior. Uh, so then we wonder if the mechanical signal can affect in this biochemical oscillation. So in collaboration with Jianping Fu's lab uh, from mechanical engineering, uh, so we are, we're trying to understand this by uh, isolate the single cells and put it on the micro post uh, where we can change the surface rigidity quantitatively and also can stretch the cells. We also change the cell density, uh, which in this case, there is a study in mouse. Uh, they, they put cells at different density and they found that uh, the higher of the density cells coordinate and seems to allow the better oscillations the clock. I want to stop here um, by thank everyone in the lab. Uh, so I'm highlighting here are uh, the, the students and postdocs are working on the um, projects that I introduced the most. Uh, so Mon uh, and Ye has initially developed this uh, uh, microfluidic droplet system uh, for developing this uh, uh, artificial cells. And uh, Minjin Owen uh, 
they collaborate for uh, two projects, the Metallica Wave project and also the uh, the Mid Blaster Transition project. And Shi Yan and Zhen Da and Meng uh, collaborate for the tunability project and Shi Yan also leads for the energy dependent project. Uh, Daniel and Patrick are also involved in this project. And uh, I want to thank uh, my collaborators and fundings. Um, I know it's a kind of a long, uh, so, but I'm happy to take any questions uh, if you have any. Thanks. Great. Uh, any questions related to this? Yes. Oh, there's a microphone behind you. Yeah. Oh, it works. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you for the excellent talk. So I have some question about the nuclei. So you, in the first few slides, you show us some video on the nuclear formation and um, disassembly. So um, how is the morphology of the nuclear is determined? Is it membrane bound or is it like just a droplet formation? And then when you talk about the nuclear waves, when you add the DNA to form those nuclear waves, it seems that the nucleus in that case is pretty homogeneous in size. So why is that? Compared to the um, the different morphology of the nuclear at the first few slides. Yeah. So uh, to maybe to your second question first uh, is um, so I don't think it's a necessary. We don't see um, like uh, statistically the droplet case has uh, less uniform uh, you know nuclear shape and uh, size than the than the tube case. Maybe I mean the students over there can correct me. Um, but it's it's really less controlled by us. So some in some specific case you have um, some weird shape of the nucleus. I guess what you are talking about is this mm. one, um, the ones that. So probably sorry, probably the the ones of here, and then eventually they also crazily rotating, which we still don't know. I think this is a really largely unknown thing for us as well. Uh, for the for the tube case, um, I think sometimes we also see nuclear aggregates, um, but it's uh, yeah. I, I think it's hard to say. So what kind of DNA did you add into it to form the nuclear wave? So this one is a sperm DNA isolated from the xenopod. And, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The other. Questions? Eric, yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so you identified this correlation between ATP concentration and the amplitude of your oscillation. I was wondering if you had any sort of insight into the biological reason as to why that relationship exists. ATP oscillation and uh, what? Uh, the ATP levels and the amplitude of your oscillation. Oh, uh, well, so the the reporter we have is a is a securin is a is an anaphase substrate. So it's basically it's sensing ATP. Uh, so so this one uh, so the when ATP is high, uh, it will it's an E three ubiquitin ligase. It's basically it will target this uh, securin like right here for degradation. So that means if you have low ATP, your your mRNA of securin keep translating during that interface. Only when your ATP turns on, it starts to degrade. So that's why um, if you have lower ATP, you will have higher amplitude. I mean, of this report. I think there was one more, yeah? Maybe we can pass the mic back, yeah? Sorry, I missed the majority of your talk. Uh, but I have a, have a question regarding this, uh, this uh, oscillation. Have you? Does it affect the secretion function of the cell, or you are not measuring any? This is a um, this is a water in oil emulsion. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I don't know when you talk about secreting. Are yeah, you talking about the into the into, your into the environment? Yeah. Um, Does it I don't know if it's possible in our current case, but it's not even uh, like a mm, like a lipid bilayer. It's just a yeah. single. Like emotion and um, yeah, but I know. I mean, for example, Alan Liu's lab, they try to generate this bilayer, uh, the bilayer thing, and then they seem to they, they are interested in some ion channels. So okay, I think okay. that might be the next. Uh, thank you. 
Any other thoughts? Uh, if not, let's uh, thank Chong Yun for a great talk.